when I was in college, once a month I would go to a Christian group, I'd go with a Christian group to a neighborhood in Nacogdoches where we would meet with some of the kids that lived there, we would play games with them, have refreshments, tell them Bible stories. And uh, one day we were there, one of the little boys and one of the little girls had been arguing and being, being really ugly with each other. And while the kids were playing, the little boy fell down and scraped his knee. And while he was sitting there on the ground, holding his knee and grimacing, the little girl that had been arguing with him began to cheer. And she encouraged all her friends to join in. She was leaning, clapping her hands and shouting, We are glad! We are glad! One of the little fellow was down there in pain on the ground. I could tell we had a lot of work to do. <laughs> I was pretty sure Jesus would not have done that. After all, there's a proverb in the Bible that says, Don't rejoice when your enemy falls. Don't be happy when they stumble. And yet, in our reading from Revelation today, we see a city falling. We see a city going up in flames. And in heaven, there is rejoicing. They are glad. Remind us of another proverb in the Bible which says, When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. When the wicked perish, there are shouts of joy. During Easter time, you might have noticed that our epistle lessons have been from the letter that is called Revelation. And when you look at the Sunday lectionary, you can see that we don't often have readings from the book of Revelation. If you're kind of nerdy and into this kind of thing, I can show you there's a little thing online called a reverse lectionary. And you can go, if you have a passage in mind like Philippians 2 or something like that, you can go down to Philippians 2 and it will tell you if or and when it's going to be read on a Sunday morning. And so this week I thought about that and I went and looked at Revelation and I saw that really this is the only year of our three-year schedule when we have several Sundays in a row with readings from the book of Revelation. And so a few weeks ago we looked at the passage that describes what John saw when he looked into the throne room of, room of heaven. And today with God's help I'd like for us to look at this passage from Revelation 19 and actually the couple of chapters that come before it as well. So this passage talks about the fate of a city. Before we get there, it might help to look at what life was intended to be in God's city or in God's land. And from the very beginning, God instructed His people that their lives were to be quite different from the lives of those around them. They were to be a holy people. He was a holy God. They were to be holy people. And what did that look like practically? You can think about our reading from Leviticus today to get started. Um, we'd read this verse, but they were to be respectful. They were to honor their father and mother. The verses we did read, they were to be a generous people. This would have driven some people in capitalist USA crazy, but when they harvested their crops, they were not to harvest to the very edges of the field or to pick up what the harvesters dropped, or they were not to strip the grapevines bare. When some people would drive them crazy, and think, you know, I'm, I'm losing money if I don't do this, if I don't harvest that. But God instructed them to leave some on the edges because the Lord wanted the poor and foreigners to be able to gather up that grain, to pick those grapes, to have something to eat. They were to be generous. They were to be honest, the Lord's people were. They were not to steal or deceive or cheat. They were to pay their workers on the day when they worked. They were to be kind and not cruel. They were never to insult a deaf person or cause a blind person to stumble. They were to be just. In their courts, they weren't to favor the poor or be partial to the rich. They were not to spread gossip. They were not to nurse hatred or hold grudges. In Jesus' words today, we can sum up most of this, they were to love one another. Our song today says that the Lord is merciful and compassionate. He is faithful, righteous, kind, just. He helps those who fall and lifts up those who are bowed down. That is what God is like. And that is what God's people were to be. They were to be like their God. And who would not want to live in a nation like that? But when we come to this section of Revelation, we find a city whose life is almost exactly the opposite of that. This city is personified as a woman who rules on seven hills. Of course, Rome was famously situated on seven hills. And many, many scholars identify this woman as Rome. If that's true, then most of the book of Revelation is not about the end of the world. It's a dramatic description of the fall of Rome, and maybe even some about the fall of Jerusalem that came before that. Now, not all Christians think that, but we can make a really good case for it. 
So God, remember, had judged Jerusalem and his people by the hand of the Romans, but Rome also had her own wickedness, and for that she would be judged. And so we, we see this woman sitting on a scarlet beast, probably signifying Roman imperialism and military might. And at one level, this woman was quite attractive. She was clothed in purple and scarlet clothing. She had beautiful jewelry made of gold and pearls and precious gems. The description in Revelation doesn't say so, but we can imagine that her makeup had probably been laid on pretty thick, like Jezebel in the Old Testament. And in her hand, she was holding a goblet made of gold. Right? She looked inviting, enticing. But all of this was a deception. Because that gold goblet was full of urine, feces, all kinds of filth. And on her forehead there was this name written, Babylon the Great, mother of all whores and obscenities in the world. This was the woman who ruled where the people of God lived. This was the city and the culture that surrounded them. When they were gathering together just like we are this morning. But God's people were different, right? They were holy. They were called to be what we're still called to be. Generous, kind, moral, upright. Only enjoying sexual relations between one man and one woman who are married to each other. But if you choose to stand firm, to be holy, and not to follow the poor, she can grow violent. And when John looked at this woman, he saw that she was drunk. She was drunk with the blood of the saints. The Christians whom she had put to death because they had remained faithful to God and refused to swear allegiance to her or go along with her ways. It was this mighty empire that God had used to judge his people, the Jewish people. But now again she too was going to answer for her sins and when God's judgment came upon her it was going to come swiftly. But first there was this voice in the preceding chapters. There was a voice that called to the Lord's people, and this is what it said. Come away from her. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. That's a call that still comes to God's people. As we find ourselves surrounded by a culture that is increasingly characterized by greed and violence and sexual immorality, the call still comes to us, come away. Come away. Separate yourselves so that you will not be judged with her. Because Rome was going to fall. And when this great city, with its mighty economy, fell, the kings of the world who had committed adultery with her and enjoyed all of her luxury, those kings began to mourn. Passages in Revelation tell us or show us how, how great that economy had been. Listen to this. He says, The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. She bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant wood, ivory goods, objects made of expensive wood. Bronze, iron, marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, wagons, and bodies. That is, human slaves. The Roman roads and docks had been full and busy with all of the imports rolling in from all these other nations, but that would be no more. John writes again, the merchants who became wealthy by selling her these things will stand at a distance. Terrified by her great torment, they will weep and cry out, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. She was clothed in finest purple and scarlet linen, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls, and in a single moment, all the wealth of the city is gone. Her citizens nations around her thought that Rome was invincible, but she crumbled quickly. It's hard to read this and hear this, isn't it, without asking the question, where is Rome today? Where is the nation with the greatest military today? Where is 
the nation with the flourishing economy that all other nations look to and do business with? Is that nation being faithful to God? Or has she become a prostitute filled with greed and violence and immorality? Back to Revelation where John writes, Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge millstone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, Just like this, the great city Babylon, codenamed for Rome, will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. She would drop like a rock in a pond. Listen to this description. The sound of harps, singers, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No craftsmen, no trades will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of the lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you deceived the nations with your sorcerers. In your streets flows the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, and the blood of all people slaughtered all over the world. Well, when this woman was destroyed, when this city fell, you could hear mourning and wailing throughout the earth. But Christians had seen through this woman's disguise. They knew what she had really been. They knew that she had opposed God in his good ways. She had oppressed the poor. She had committed murder. Christians had seen her take their mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and throw them into prison or cut off their heads or put them into arenas with wild beasts. And so finally when this wicked woman went up in flames, though the earth was mourning, heaven was rejoicing. And John says, after this, we're to our lesson today now, after this I heard what sounded like a vast crowd in heaven shouting hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. His judgments are true and just. He has punished the great poor who corrupted the earth with their immorality. He has avenged the murder of his servants. And again their voices rang out. Hallelujah, the smoke from that city ascends forever and ever. They were glad. But that was not the end of the story. Because now that that wicked woman had been destroyed, the party could begin. Now that the poor was gone, the bride could shine. And John says this, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now we might think of the bride of Christ as the church, and Paul uses that imagery elsewhere. Later in Revelation, when the angel takes John to see the bride, the wife of the Lamb, he sees the city, the holy city Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And if the bride here is the city, then it helps us to think about the bride's clothing, the bride's garments. The prostitute had been clothed with all kinds of the evil, violent, and moral works of her children. But the bride is clothed in bright and pure linen, which are the good deeds of the saints. The saints' good deeds make up the beautiful clothing of this city. And this city is the wife of the Lamb. As her husband, he delights in her, he nourishes her, he cherishes her. As his bride, she submits to him and opens herself to receive his love. He opens his arms to her. She opens her heart to him. And he comes in to dwell in her, and the two become one flesh. That is one reason that marriage is so important, and why Satan is so eager to attack that sacred institution. Because one of the best pictures of the relationship between God and his people 
is the relationship of a faithful husband and a faithful wife. So St. Paul writes about marriage. You're familiar with the passage. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Unfortunately, in many parts of our country, those words that I just said are considered hate speech. When you talk about a marriage of a husband and wife, you have to say a male husband and a female wife, that is considered hate speech, which might show us where our nation is heading, how an ancient prophecy like this one might apply to our own nation now. But what can we take from all this? Well, we can say this. God wins. God wins. The Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. God made a world that was filled with truth and goodness and beauty, a world in which He intended to live with His people who would be faithful and kind and holy, and God will ultimately judge and destroy everything that opposes that purpose. God loves this world too much to let evil ruin it. Great prostitutes will rise and deceive, but eventually they will fall. Eventually only God and His people will live together on an earth that is filled with beauty and goodness and truth. And so this morning, let us confess our sins. Let us lay aside those rags that are not fit to wear to the feast. Let us come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us sit down with our husbands who opens his arms to receive us. Let us open our hearts to him, so that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. If you are watching from home today and unable to receive the body of Christ in person, please join with us in the following prayer. Dear Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you, together with all your faithful people gathered around every altar of your church, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Thank you for watching the broadcast today. We hope you will visit the campus of the Church of the Resurrection and take advantage of the many ministries available to you and your family. Until next week, may God richly bless you and keep you.